All right. Hey, everyone, if you're here, go ahead and say hey in the chat. We'd love to hear from you. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone who's attending. Awesome. Hi. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Live streaming is so crazy because you all were already here and I didn't see any of you. Wow. Hey, Phoenix. <laughs> all right. And while we wait for more folks to roll in, go ahead and let me know where are you joining us from in the world today? And maybe share one thing that you're most excited to hear about today. And then we'll get started in just a minute. Awesome. We've got someone from South Africa, Russia, Atlanta, SF, El Salvador. Oh my gosh, amazing. I love it. Asia, UK. Beautiful. Thank you all for joining us from across the world. We really appreciate it. I know the timing is always difficult for um, global audiences, but it means so much to us that you're here. Cool, Guyana. So great. Wow, I love seeing everyone who's here. I'm going to take time later to read through the whole chat, but I appreciate you all. So let's kick it off. Welcome everyone to RepelCon, first ever. Um, and I'm so, so excited to get this party started with each of you. Um, so our co-founder and CEO, Amjad Mossad, he will be giving an opening keynote in just a few moments. But I have just a couple of um, announcements I want to make before we begin. The first is that um, today is stacked with great content. We have a lot of overlapping sessions. You could fill every single minute of your day with a session today. So if you miss something, don't worry. We are recording every single session. We'll be sharing them on social. You'll be able to revisit the recordings. Um, and so you'll have ways to relive all of this content after today. So don't let the FOMO um, stop you from exploring and, and jumping in and really um, engaging with the sessions that you can attend. If it's all too much and you need a break, I recommend you stop by the Turtle Lounge. Um, it'll be an all-day session starting after this keynote. It's developed by one of our engineers, Ted, and it's just a fun drawing game where you can get creative and see what other folks are creating as well. If you need any help with the Turtle Lounge, we've also got our Discord channel, um, RepelCon. You can find the link to that in the Turtle Lounge if you need any help and also just to join our Discord community. Now, if you need to access captions in any session, you can click the captions tab, which is gonna be on the right side of your screen in um, sessions later today. And if you don't see that, you can click on the CC button below the, um, the video screen. And then we'll be posting polls throughout the day. There are already a couple of them live, so make sure that you chime in. Right now in our what's your favorite programming language, Python seems to be in the lead. If you feel otherwise, make sure to add your vote to that poll. And then lastly, it goes without saying, but Replit is for everyone. In the same vein, Replcon is for everyone. And so please do your part today to ensure that all participants feel safe and welcome to our community. We are not going to tolerate any harassment of any participant in any form today, and we'll remove any attendee who violates this expectation. If you need any concerns, you can DM me um, or the other organizers on Hopin, and we'll be happy to help you out. We are looking forward to a really fun day. So without further ado, I want to introduce our keynote speaker, Amjad. Amjad does not yeah. need any introduction in a space like this. Um, but for those of you who might not know, Amjad is the co-founder and CEO of Replit. You've probably heard of it. Um, and before founding Replit, he led JavaScript infrastructure engineering at Facebook and was the founding engineer at Codecademy. He and his wife slash co-founder Haya launched Replit in 2016 and were later accepted into the Y Combinator Startup Accelerator. You'll be hearing more about what we've been up to since 2016 and what might be coming after today. Um, in all of the sessions that are coming up. And without further ado, Amjad, take it away. 
Thank you. Thanks, Lena. It's super exciting. I mean, seeing people from all over the world, <clears throat> if it's late um, in your side of the world, I, we're super appreciative that you stayed late. If it's early, you woke up early to, for this. That's really awesome. So um, like Lena said, I'm the CEO and co-founder of uh, Windit. Uh, sorry, I mean Replit. Um, and um, if you're in the Discord, you know. Um, and um, so today... It's super, super exciting. You know, if you told me a few years ago um, when when we were starting the company that I'm going to be here talking about um, giving keynote at a conference for Replit, it, I would not have believed you. And there would be hundreds of people, thousands of people who signed up, hundreds of people in the chat. And um, it's uh, it's truly a privilege. And, uh, and I'm excited to be here with you. We have a lot of amazing content. We have a lot of amazing announcements. So towards the end, we're going to have also a surprise for you. So stick with us all the way to the end. All right. So I want to start uh, from the basics. You know, Before we uh, talk about anything else, I want to just talk about what we're doing here. What really, what, what, you know, what do we wake up every day trying to achieve? And um, last year, we decided to change our mission statement a little bit. And we wanted to um, say something and we wanted to aim for something really, really ambitious. Something that's going to take us years, maybe decades to achieve. We arrived at this idea that we want to be the first software programming environment want to be the first platform to bring the next billion software creators online. So why is this important? So we feel like today it's a very special time in the history of the world. There's been uh, times where there's major shifts that happen. And we think this is one of those times. You see humanity go from agriculture to industrial society. We think today there's this shift from industrial to information society, especially with the pandemic over the past few years, um, remote work and what people are calling the metaverse and VR and all these things. There's this feeling that society is restructuring around the idea that most of what we do with our day is going to be around information, software, data, I'm sure most of you here, uh, you know, the way you work or the way you study is mostly via computers and mostly via the internet. And we think that's that's a change that's that's going to stay. And as part of these changes, um, there's a there's a reskilling that happens. You know, when 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 the world moved into industrial society, people had to learn to read and write. People had to learn mathematics. Even if you're not a mathematician, you learned basic algebra, things to help you with your jobs day to day. And we think the same thing is going to be happen about, uh, around software. I think at minimum, people learn how to code. People learn how computers work. And this is very important because otherwise, we're going to have society where there's going to be producers and there's going to be consumers. Meaning most of the software is created by a few and the rest of the world is just merely consuming software. Now, there's nothing wrong with consuming or using someone else's software. But it's important that we don't have this big division in society where there's the creators and then there's the consumers. Because as we've seen in the past few years around the news around social media algorithms and things like that, there are ways to manipulate uh, using computers and the internet if the population does not really understand how these things work. So at the minimum level, we think there's going to be uh, we think at least people are going to learn how computers work and how to do programming. We also think that programming will go from uh, something that's merely about creating software into something about more about creative, more expressive. You know, a lot of you uh, use Replit. Maybe you make games with it. Maybe you use Kaboom JS, our game programming library, which we have a session about today as well. Um, and a lot of what we see at Replit is like people want to make things to express themselves. 
this is also true of sites like Scratch and many people, you know, go start at Scratch and then come, come to Replit. Programming stopped being just about the utilitarian aspect of it, you know, the, the enterprise, you know, boring software. It's about expressing yourself. It's about automating certain things in your life. It's about using it in your job in creative and interesting ways. And so software goes from this like niche thing that a few do right now, less than way less than half a percent of the world, maybe 25 million professional developers who create most of the software. We think that's probably in some capacity is going to be, uh, it's going to be at least a billion. And the reason we think that is not because, you know, uh, everyone will be a professional coder, but because coding or creating software is going to enter the public consciousness as something that we do and that we understand. We do not know what kind of innovations will lead us to that point. Right now, we're focused on you, on the coder, to make your life better, to make Replit more powerful for you, more scalable. We're trying to uh, get, get our tools in the hands of the people who do not have access to them. For example, supporting mobile devices and in, in, in internet connections that might not be the best. But in the future, we think we can innovate to reach more and more people. We think part of the solution is going to be something like AI, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit later today, to help you learn to code, to help you understand your code. So there's a lot of things that we have to build to get to that billion number. But we want to set something really ambitious so that, you know, we're you know, we know what we're aiming at and we're just like not lost in the day to day. So we talked about why we're here. Now I want to take you, I want to take you back to where it all started. And um, as many of you know, I uh, was born and grew up in Jordan. And uh, while we didn't have a lot growing up, we had access to computers at a young age and that, and I taught myself programming and that really opened a world of opportunities for me leading to this point where I'm talking to you. When I was a teenager, I built my first, uh, my first business. I was really obsessed with Canvas strike and esports. I used to go to these LAN gaming environments. I don't think they have them anymore. Maybe there's a few of them, but you used to walk into a shop, and there's computers and you can like go in and play a game with other people. Um, now, now you can do it on the internet. Back then bandwidth did not allow, so you had to go somewhere and play land games. And what I noticed is at least back in Jordan, they did not use any software to, um, to manage uh, these stores and they did a lot of things manually. So that was my first business idea was I wanted to build the software to manage these stores and it took me literally two or three years. I think I started when I was 12 and I shipped my first product when I was uh, 15. And I, I remember at the time I was, you know, I was at home programming all the time. My friends, uh, my friends thought, thought I died at some point. Like they, they just, uh, they just didn't see me out in the neighborhood playing and, and they would like check in with my family and just to see what happened to me. I was so obsessed with this idea. I wanted to bring it to life, but it was difficult. Figuring out how to package the software was difficult. Figuring out how to do databases was difficult. But it was a very, very edifying experience and also made a lot of money from it. When the time came to go into college, um, you know, I wanted to um, I, I wanted to do something other than programming. I thought I had mastered programming. Now I know that I was nowhere near that. But I, just because I could write some Visual Basic and I could sh ship software, I wrote a little bit of PHP. I thought that's you know there wasn't a lot more left to learn. So I wanted to branch out and learn other things. I went into. Uh, I also thought that like at some point AI will automate software, which turned out to be uh, to be way way ahead of its time. Maybe someday, but it's going to be way further in the future. So I went into computer engineering. I wanted to study how computers were made, so maybe I could uh, uh, maybe I could understand computers better, and maybe I could create a job from that. And so, uh, went into university to study computer engineering, and pretty soon I figured that I really like programming a lot better. 
I learned a lot. I learned a lot of low level things that would help me in the future, especially as, as we're building uh, Replit. And at the time I started um, learning about the history of programming languages. I was reading Paul Graham's blog and Paul Graham is now is a Replit investor, which is awesome how all these things kind of connect. And he was writing about Lisp and writing about the early days of programming. And that really inspired me to learn more about Lisp and Scheme. As, I, as you see, our classic t-shirt sort of has that like the, the one line of code that re represents our company, read, eval, print, loop. And what I noticed almost immediately that um, it's really hard to learn a new programming language. You have to go through the docs and figure out how to install it. Well, first of all, you have to have a computer that you own so you can install software on it. And then you write, write some code, but say you wanna share that code or say you wanna uh, share the app, the result of that code, or you wanna code with other people. It was really unclear how to do that. It's still very difficult to do that with that Replit. And then as I got into, as I changed my major into computer science, I would see uh, students and, and professors using Word docs to send code around. It just felt very backwards. It felt in the same way that when I wrote that software to manage the LAN gaming uh, store where you had a lot of computers, but they did things manually. It was the sa same thing where we have all these computers that we're writing code on, but we're not really running it. We're sending these Word docs around. And so I started searching, can you code on the internet? I started searching around, like, can you code on the, in the browser? Google Docs had just come out and I thought, of course, there's going to be something like Google Docs, but for programming. So that was around 2009 and there was nothing. There was almost nothing. There was some experiments going around. I think uh, Mozilla had an experiment around coding the browser, but I really couldn't find anything that would solve my problem. So naively, I started building what became uh, the first multi-language browser sandbox. I recruited uh, some friends uh, from, uh, from university to work with me. Haya, who's now my co-founder, uh, uh, helped us with the design and the UI and the logo at the time. And we open sourced the creation. So what we did, we, uh, we ended up being the first project to compile languages that are not JavaScript to JavaScript. At the time, there was this experimental project called mscripten, which is now known as WASM. It was coming out of Mozilla and we found it and we were very early to, to find that project. And we ended up compiling a bunch of languages like Python, Ruby, and uh, Lua, and a bunch of languages we liked into, uh, into JavaScript. And we open sourced that engine uh, and we call it JS REPL. And then we built the sort of the, you know, what became Replit, the UI on top of that. And that went viral. That went super viral. And it was very, very surprising. We announced it on Hacker News, I think. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm now dating myself, but in 2011, Slashdot was still a thing. And so we, we uh, also made it on Slashdot and Reddit and a bunch of other places. And here we are few kids in Jordan uh, going viral on the on the internet for something we created. Companies started reaching out to us. Eventually, what we built uh, was the start of what became this interactive in-browser programming learning that became like Code Academy and Udacity. All these projects started using the original Replit open source engine to deliver in-browser experiences. After that happened, I realized this could be a much bigger idea. It was not only gonna be easy to learn new programming languages, to share code, to code with other people, but it could also change people's lives. For the first time, you could actually start to learn how to code without investing in an expensive machine. You could, you could even do it on your phone if you like. And if we did that and we gave people the tools to learn how to code, then the tools to create and ship we could, uh, this idea could, uh, could, could grow into something really, really big. So this was the first kind of Replit UI. You could see the 
editor on the left, you can see the run button sort of on the corner over there, not very great UI with that and, and the console on the right. And that's it, you could pick a language and you could just write one file and you can like evaluate that code. It had a lot of bugs, especially because it was running in the browser, but, uh, but it was good enough to prove the idea. People really loved it. After I got my job at Code Academy as one of the founding engineers, um, we sort of neglected, neglected the project for a long time up until the point in 2016 when Hai and I decided to revive it and make it into a company, which is what we're working on until today. So one of the first things that we did in 2016 was move Replit to the server side. So now you could do things like file systems. Um, you could do things like packages. And this was an early, uh, this was an early implementation of the file system that we wrote. And basically when you created a file, it would appear as a tab. So say you're doing matplotlib and uh, you, you're doing some data science and you generate an image and it would like auto update in the browser. And we thought that was super cool. So that was the first sort of advanced feature where you had multiple tabs and we didn't have a file tree or any of that, but that was, uh, that was really a great start for us. Then, uh, then came the community. Um, actually, we, uh, we had a, the, the way the community and like the way, like all of you today, a lot of you that are in the Replip community, like the start of this was so strange. Um, so basically we have, we had a bug, we had a bug board called Canny and we used it just for people to report bugs and vo vote on feature requests. It, what we saw was that people were starting to share their programs there. So in this case, uh, I remember a user called uh, Pi, uh, Pi Elias and he built a chat system in the REPL. So at the time we didn't have hosting. Uh, we just had we just had opened up internet connection inside the REPL. And so he made a like a backend REPL that stored the state and then a front end REPL where you fork it and then you join the server. And so you had the chat in the REPL itself. And they posted it on our on our bug board and then people started using it. And I remember looking at this, it was like, okay, this is very strange. And I log into it, I run the code and suddenly seeing tens and hundreds of people chatting. And it's almost like we had this shadow community that we did not know existed. It was really fun and people were sharing things and people were talking about their programs. They were asking questions, sort of, this was the, the you know, proto discord. That was before we had the discord. And, um, and because of this fun coincidence, we decided to make community part of a big part of what we do. It was really inspiring to see a lot of, especially young people building things and, and sharing it and helping each other. That really opened our eyes to what could, what could Replit become. It was not only gonna be this online sandbox where you could like learn a bit of code and practice programming, but you could also join a community of creators and build things together and really have fun and, and, and enjoy the act of building. So that was the initial uh, community aspect, which now, you know, now we're on the third or fourth iteration of um, with, with the com new community uh, design that we launched uh, earlier this year. Hosting with, was another big one. We were actually just got into Y Combinator. Y Combinator is this accelerator that, um, that you go in for three months and you know, as the same as the name suggests, you sort of accelerate your product roadmap, so you can uh, you can you can get to market as fast as possible. You know, at that point, we realized that um, people wanted to do more with Replit. They wanted packages. They wanted to host their programs. They wanted to launch apps and get feedback on them. So we decided uh, the next big step is going to be to make it so that um, so that you can host the the programs. At the same time, we built the file tree on the left. And one thing, you know, that still lives with us today is we decided to keep the uh, interface very simple. A lot of companies at this point will start complicating things. Maybe we'll start building different versions of the product. Uh, and we thought about all of this. Maybe there's like a simple REPL. Maybe there's a projects REPL where you, you could do hosting or whatever. But we decided to keep it simple. We're like, all right, we're not going to make the entry experience worse. We just want to we just want to add a new feature. Uh, to make it better. So we did this thing where 
whenever you start a server, we detect it on the back end and then open the window for you. That that's like the web view. It was on the bottom right at the time. Now it's in the top right, and we hosted the 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 program for you once you once you start listening on the port. So that kind of magical experience is basically like detecting what the user does and what the user intends to do, and then doing it for them has become a big part of our design philosophy. And just to keep the interface simple, and then uh, expand it with time. And I'll talk a little bit more about what we're doing with regards to this idea of like simple yet scalable. This is a theme that we try to um, that we try to uh, that we try to continue to innovate on. It's like start simple, but it should be powerful enough to um, uh, to support your entire workflow. Multiplayer was a big, big milestone in, in Replit's history. I think the first version was also 2018, maybe in, in the fall of 2018. And the first version actually sucked. Um, we, um, we, did, we did this thing where we hosted a separate server that was the multiplayer server that did the operational transforms, that did the live editing, that did the chat and all of that. And then you had the REPL, um, in, in a different place, essentially, on a different server, the container. And um, and the way you collaborate is by going through this intermediary server that does the collaboration for you. And that was full of bugs. And that was full of state issues because now you had like three different sources of truth, your browser, the collaboration server, and then the container REPL itself. Um, and then this took multiple iterations. We ended up rewriting our entire infrastructure uh, and we wrote a blog post about it at the time. We talked about uh, making Replit collaborative at heart. And then Replit became the first by default collaborative uh, code editor. Most code editors that want to add collaboration features, you have to turn them on. With Replit, actually, it is collaborative even in the default state. So try this, open a REPL twice in two different tabs. You're gonna see the cursor you can code in different tabs at the same time, and you can see yourself like editing the document in real time. And so, so Replit is still, I think, the most advanced multiplayer editor in the world. And that's because we we tried really hard to kind of bake it into the system and not have it as an afterthought. All right, so that was that was the kind of the the last phase phase of of of, of Replit's history. Uh, where we were a very small team, we didn't have access to a lot of capital. Uh, you know, as as Lena mentioned, it took us two or three years before we got into YC. We got rejected four or five times. Um, Roy, who's going to be talking uh, later today at the cl closing keynote, was 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 kind of the investor that took a chance on us. And uh, but at a time where nobody would talk to us, I remember pitching a hundred investors, and they would all, you know. You know, um, you know, some of them would yawn and even sleep in the uh, when I'm pitching them, and there was really no interest in 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 what we're doing. Uh, and then, so, so for the longest time, we were four or five people kind of working on this project. But you know, recently we've been able to uh, make a lot of progress uh, that allows us to get. Um, a lot more uh, support, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But let's let's take a snapshot of where we are in terms of our community and our growth. Uh, today, we have more than 10 million coders on the platform, and um, just last year we doubled that. So we started 2021 you know, with 5 million, we ended up with uh, with 10 million. So like doubling the number of of coders in one year. Uh, you all built more than 20 million apps and websites on, on the service. And so that that sort of boggles my mind, that kind of scale we're, we're operating at. Just to give you an idea, it's um, these user apps are getting more than 10 billion visits uh, a month. And so uh, Replit in its own right is becoming this somewhat large computing infrastructure that we're, we're having to manage. So the company... You know, like I said, you can see you can see sort of uh, this graph. Um, you know, on the y-axis is the number of employees, on the x-axis is the year. And so, 2016, 17, 18, we're like you know two, three, four people. But in 2019, we doubled to eight. 2020 to 16. 2020 to 32. 
And now we're approaching 60 employees. So we've been doubling the number of employees year over year. And as you can see, we've been able to make more progress. A lot of companies, as they start to grow, they actually slow down. Refit actually have accelerated product development tremendously um, as, as we've grown. And just recently, we hired an executive team uh, just as part of growing up as a company. We have a CFO. We have a head of uh, BD and a, and a general counsel. And of course, we have VP of engineering, growth, and all of that, and, and head of design. Um, and, uh, and so that's like a really entering a new phase of the company's life. Uh, and we managed to raise now over $100 million. So our last raise was $80 million. And before that, we raised $20 million in Series A, before that seed and, and pre-seed. But now we have a lot of capital to go really build our, our, our vision. Because we were, you know, we were such a small team, but we had a really big ambition. Now we're, we're a good-sized team, and we're going to really finally be able to execute on these big, big ideas. So here's the team uh, last year. This is at our offsite. And this is around the time I think we we're like 25, maybe 30 people. Uh, so really more than doubled since then. Um, and we have another offsite uh, coming soon. And we'll, we'll take a bigger picture, a picture with more of the team. So, okay, let's take a snapshot of the, of the product today. Um, just in the past uh, few months to a year, we've been able to go from supporting a set number of languages to essentially every language and package. So we rewrote our infrastructure to use this amazing technology that's quite niche, not many people use it, but we think we like to be pioneers. We like to, to do things differently, but we think the rest of the industry will follow us as they usually do. So uh, we use Nix to rebuild our infrastructure so that you can really get any language or any Linux package uh, in an instant. Like everything is cached and uh, you don't really have to install anything. So you just select the packages. You just put in the packages in your next description that you'd like, and it will generate essentially a new runtime for you. So I, I want to emphasize this has never been done before. If you, for example, if you've used Heroku or AWS Lambda or any cloud runtime, typically uh, the runtime is 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 pre-installed for you. So it'll give you the the packages you need to build your app. And every once in a while, they'll tell you to upgrade. Hey, a new Node version came out. Why don't you upgrade your Heroku? And it's like this new, this like you know this whole project that you need to do in order to upgrade. For the first time you have a completely flexible runtime. And with one click of a button, you can generate a new runtime. You can fork someone else, uh, else's runtime, add a package, change something about the configuration and generate uh, a new runtime. So this is has never been done before. And we're still kind of rolling it out in a way because we rolled out for most of the languages, if not all of the languages, but there's still a lot to do in order to open it up for everyone. Uh, we'll talk about that more in a bit. Uh, we, we spent a lot of time, uh, especially uh, around the pandemic, when the pandemic hit, we spent a lot of time uh, making our mobile support a lot better, which led all the way to kind of rewriting our entire editor. Part of the reasoning there is because there were a lot of kids that used to have access to computers at school that now lost the access to computers and they were trying to use Replit uh, at home. And um, basically, in the past couple of years, the Repl usage on mobile grew almost 20x. It was less, it was less than 1% of our user base that used uh, anything in mobile. And now it's, more, it's, it's around 20%. So 20x growth is, is, is really fascinating on a certain platform. Um, and, uh, and we think there's way more to come. And I'll talk about that in a bit as well. We also introduced a lot of tools for power users. We introduced boosts so you can uh, you can give your REPL more resources. We introduced always on so you don't have to do pinging hacks and you can just uh, you can just ho host your code easily. We introduced resource mo monitoring so you can know when you're running out of resources, and we introduced file system persistence, which means that you can store things in the REPL itself. You can have a file system based database like SQLite. Um, or you can just simply write to files, which a lot of people like to do. Uh, and again, this is also um, something that most providers, most platform as services don't don't provide. 
Um, and this is something really unique to Replit as just persisting uh, all your data. It, you know, this discussion would not be complete without talking about performance. We've gotten feedback from, from our users that performance and uh, by performance, I mean just general reliability, stability, and speed of the product is, is something really important. And uh, I want to clarify, like we talk a lot about shipping at Replit. We, we have this shirt called Shipping Season. And I think we have a website called ship.fast. Uh, and uh, we, we just talk about shipping, but you know, people think that we're really focused on new features, but actually if you, you know, if you come to, to Replit and talk to people day to day, you'll see that like a big part of the company is just focused on making things better. So, if, you know, the first chart is BSODs, which is our um, blue screen of death uh, equivalent for our editor. I'm sure if you're a Replit user for a long time, you've ran, it, ran into the editor crashes and we just recently, that was last month, we cut this by 70%. And that was the second time we cut it by equivalent. So we cut it by 50% a few months ago, and now 70%. We're going to drive it to zero. And so that's a big, big, big focus uh, for us. Um, response time for your apps, the proxy response time, we cut it recently by 80%. Um, and we squashed a lot of data loss issue. Like, again, if you're, if you're a Replit user from 2019, 2020, you remember we had this this endemic data loss issue. Like there was a good chance if you use Replit for a long time in a single session, especially in multiplayer, you would run into problems of the multiplayer going out of sync, or um, or uh, you would you would like straight up just lose lose data, which is awful. Which is like the worst thing that a product could do. And so that we took it really seriously. And it's like very, very important for us that this, that you would never lose data, that you trust Replit with everything. And we use Replit internally for our notes. We use it for a lot of our apps and backends and bots. And, um, and, 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 and we think it's like, if it's, um, we, we need to feel the pain and we do really feel the pain whenever, uh, whenever these issue, issues arise. So I want to make sure that you understand we're focused on that. And that's like a big part of what, what we do at Replit. All right. So we talked about we talked about our mission, why it's important. We talked about the past, where everything started. We talked about how things are today. Let's talk a little bit about the future. You know, what are we building? What are, what's uh, what's so exciting about Replit? There's so much to get excited about. So let's let's get into it. So I, I split it out into three things, three major categories um, uh, that, that you should uh, um, that you should know about. Um, the first one is making Replit your own. The second one is taking Replit with you. And third one is about the future of programming. So making Replit your own. A lot of you, and I'm sure a lot of you in the audience have written extensions, Chrome extensions, have written, you know, browser hacks, have written clients for Replit or you reverse engineered our multiplayer protocol and, and uh, created new clients. Th there's a lot of hacking of Replit that's really cool. And we want to encourage that. And we want, we want you to feel that Replit is yours. Yes, it's a hosted service, but it should feel yours. It should feel like you have complete control of how it feels and looks and uh, how it functions. Um, and with that, you know, the um, one of the top you know, customization uh, requests has been themes. It, it came up over the, the years in many different ways. Uh, some of our community have actually written a theme store before that's been massively popular. And, um, and uh, we're actually working on that. So uh, not only you can customize your editor and your workspace, you can customize the entire site you can customize the entire site and you can publish themes to the community and other people can use your themes as well. So in the theme creation experience is actually super cool because it's all live as you're editing it, you're editing it in a REPL. Every theme is a REPL and uh, you can, you can kind of customize the colors to your liking and, and do it all interactively. And it's super fun and easy. Here today, it's it's mostly focused on the main colors, 
But in the future, we'll also go into syntax highlighting and how we highlight syntax so you can customize the entire experience. So after you're done, you install the theme and that's it. Then you could also publish it. You want to publish it to the community. Again, it's just a REPL. You publish it to the community. It goes under the hashtag uh, themes. And then, uh, you know, you can uh, people can go browse the themes that are available under the hashtag. Click on one they might like. Hit install theme. And boom, you just got a theme. So, uh, and you can fork that theme. And you can also change it. So it follows the entire Rapid model. You can fork, remix, republish. So that's themes and it's uh, coming soon. Um, hopefully the next couple of months. All right, templates, you know, this is nothing new. Um, it, templates are uh, very important for getting started. We recently moved again with the power of Nix from the idea of languages to idea of templates. Like a, a language is a template. A language is a configuration on top of the base Replit experience. All the base Replit experience is merely based on this like uh, Nix REPL. And then all the customization happen in what we call REPL space. Basically inside the REPL in the user space, you could um, add features, you could add a debugger, you could add the package manager. Actually, if you go into any REPL and hit the three dots uh, button in the file explorer and click show config files, you can actually see how the template is built. So you can go to the Node.js REPL, for example, and see the underlying mechanics. So it's basically open. It's the, we open sourced our, um, our language and template engine. And the exciting part is that we're going to let you publish templates. So we want to make it so that in the same way that I showed you that you can publish themes, Want templates to be another things that you another thing that you can build on Replit. You can build it for yourself, but you can also share it with others. If you're a school teacher, we've seen professors create templates for their for their class to solve homework. We've seen uh, developer uh, platforms create templates for their uh, for their community. Um, and so templates is going to be a huge thing and we're going to let you publish it, let uh, people fork it and remix it, uh, just like any other REPL. And then search. So, um, so you know, for the first time, for the first time in, in history, you have access to so many code that's runnable, right? So, uh, you know, GitHub is this massive code repository. Uh, REPL is also super massive. REPL is now 100 million REPLs. And we indexed all of those and made them accessible in search. Not only that, the big difference is that any piece of code you see on REPL is runnable. Someone wrote it in there and ran it. So you can actually fork it and go run it and go try it. You can search for packages. You can um, to look at how people use the packages. You can search for people, you can search for community posts, you can search for um, uh, hashtags. Uh, just to play the video again and show you all the different things. So here's searching for Discord bot. You see REPLs, you can see templates, code snippets that could be useful for you. People, I don't know who would call themselves Discord bot, but some do. And then posts, docs, hashtags, literally everything you need is searchable from our uh, new search bar. So this is out now to everyone. It came out two days ago. So uh, check it out if you haven't. Uh, we actually have uh, we actually have an entire session about this. Um, we have um, Soren and Riza at 1 p.m. Uh, talking about this. And, oh, and um, All right, somehow my slide stopped working. Okay, cool. With regards to templates and Nix, you should check out Connor and Zach at 1 p.m. They're gonna be talking about Nix. Um, and uh, with regards to search, yeah, check out the uh, the talk at, um, also at 1 p.m. by Soren and Reza. They'll, they'll walk you through some of the 
behind the scenes data stuff that we had to do and some of the product things. All right, so what's next? Taking Replit with you. So we saw how you can make Replit your own. You can uh, customize Replit. You can create themes, you create templates. You can find code from anywhere in the world. And now we want to talk about how we're going to make it uh, really awesome to be able to uh, take Replit wherever you want, you go. So the, the, the first thing I want to talk about is, um, is, uh, is uh, geo distribution of our infrastructure. Today, sadly, most of our infrastructure is in the U.S. and um, and you know this this you know the speed of light is is pretty fast, but visiting a REPL halfway uh, across the world, for example, a round trip from Mumbai, when we have a lot of users and community members in Mumbai, and apologize for the experience, it's going to get much better soon. Uh, it takes a third of a second over really good networks. It could take over half a second for a round time. So if you're in the console and you're typing, like every keystroke is second, and that's like really, really um, annoying and noticeable. So we want everyone in the world to have a great experience. We talk about how Replit is a global community. You know, we we started Replit in Jordan. We really care about uh, really care about the international community, and so. We want Replit to work uh, really well uh, everywhere. This uh, this change requires a huge re-architecture of our infrastructure. So this project has been brewing for a long time. And again, uh, th this uh, architecture is going to make Replit faster. It's going to let us geo-distribute Replit in different uh, areas. So you know, if you're in Mumbai, you probably have a server close to you. And um, it'll unlock new use cases in the future. Uh, Luis um, is not talking about exactly about this, but I'm sure he'll mention aspects of this. He's going to talk about REPL space at 1 p.m., what you can do with, with Replit. And I'm sure he'll, he'll touch on some of the um, uh, infrastructure work we'll be doing around Geo. So, you know, anywhere in the world, you'll be able to take Replit with you. And um, most importantly is you should be able to take Replit with you on your phone. So if you're traveling, you want to, um, you know, you're traveling and then you get a phone call and like, hey, your app is not working. Or you have a client and you want to fix a bug for them. You should be able to pull out your phone, open the Replit app, edit a bit of code, run it, deploy it. And now we fix the bug while you're on vacation. Um, and of course, there's a ton of people around the world who actually don't have access to computers. We have people, uh, especially coming from um, uh, Indonesia and um, places like that, where they're primarily using Replit on the phone. It's fascinating. It's actually, most of them are using Replit on their phones and tablets as opposed to their computers. Um, and um, if you're on TikTok, there's a bunch of like viral Replit tutorials where people show you how to code on your phone. So it's been really fascinating to see, you know, it, you know, it's like, if you tell any professional programmer that people would want to code in their phone, they'll think you're crazy. But this is how crazy Replit is and the Replit community in a good way, how we're radical and, and different. And so um, coding on the phone, tablet, anywhere is, is going to be a big priority for us. So we're hoping to launch an app uh, sometime in the fall on iOS and Android, and um, it'll be it'll have ways uh, ways to learn how to code. It'll have ways to edit, of course, your code and publish and create and do all the amazing things you you expect from Replit. There's a talk Lima, who heads up mobile engineering. She's talking about building for mobile uh, right after this. All right, so this is about taking Replit with you. And the discussion of the future would not be complete without talking about the future of programming and where, where we think it's headed. So uh, a few years ago, maybe 2020, when we saw uh, the, the new language model come out, um, the, there was a, the most famous one is GPT-3 from OpenAI. It uh, immediately caught our attention and I, uh, you know, if you follow me on Twitter, you might have seen some of the hacks I did around 
GPT-3 as to applying it to code. The interesting thing about these language models is that they have very rich representation of code when they're even even if they're you know even if they're not really trained just on code, they still understand code in a very interesting way because they understand language. And by the way, code in, in natural language is actually not that different. There's uh, a lot of things about code that resembles natural language. And um, we've been exploring this for a while. We released uh, last year, we released uh, explain code. So if you're a hacker, you could go highlight any piece of code, right click and explain it. And uh, we'll give you the English natural language explanation of the code. Um, and that'll help you learn. That'll help you, especially with search. As you search for a code snippet in the community, you can go into these REPLs and explain the snippets so you can actually understand them. Uh, you can copy something from, from Stack Overflow and ask AI to explain it to you. And um, and and so today uh, we want to give you a sneak peek on something we're, we're working on, which is the ability for the AI to um, search for errors. And uh, let's see, why is it not playing? Let me click play. All right. So highlight a piece of code. This is a bubble sort. Click look for errors. And then boom, it finds a off by one error. So um, I'm going to pause it just to emphasize what happened here. So th there are there are primarily two ways of, of doing analysis over code. One is static analysis. So writing a parser and an algorithm to figure out we, what could be wrong with a, with a piece of code. So linting is an example of that. Linting, you have a set of rules for what you think the healthy code or beautiful code look like. And, you know, that will run analysis on your code and shows you like, hey, you know, um, you know th this is a bad pattern or, so, but, but it's a preset set of rules, right? So, and then you have runtime analysis. You have to run the code to see maybe the output is, is correct or wrong. So unit test is an example of that. However, there are classes of errors that would not fit in either of those. So for example, like logic errors. And uh, I, I'm sure, you know, you've had simple things like having a typo in your code and looking at it for, you know, multiple minutes up to 10 minutes before you find out that like that's you know that simple error was a freaking typo and de to detect that requires uh something way more sophistic sophisticated and different than static analysis it requires a sort of intuition and the thing about ai and what we're, what we're seeing with the lang large language models is that they have that sort of intuition so in this case the ai found that your bubble sort doesn't really feel right you know it doesn't exactly know why but it's like okay you know the, the error might be might be somewhere here um and you know that'll get better in the future and it will explain itself why but the first iteration of it is about you know if you think there's a there's an error somewhere uh, just highlight that piece of code and ask it to look for errors and i'll give you i'll give you a hint as as to where they are so again highlight look for errors and then, um, and then you know you'll be able to detect it pretty quickly. Okay, it's an off by one error, which which happens a lot. And again, linters don't catch that kind of stuff. We have um, uh, we have uh, Govin talking right after this, talking about the future of AI at Replit. So this extends to more than just looking for errors and all these tools. It's about how we think about AI holistically and how we think it's gonna it, it's gonna power Replit in the future. So that's, uh, that's AI. And then finally, we are also working in pretty advanced stage and new interface primitives. As I mentioned before, one of the interesting challenges about Replit is we want to be accessible, but we want to be powerful. These things are often at odds. Most companies pick one or the other. Most companies will say we're serious, enterprise, great software. We're going to be really powerful, but that comes at the cost of an entry uh, experience. For example, Adobe Photoshop or any professional software typically ends up being very, very complicated. At Replit, we rejected that dichotomy, but that's a challenge because now we want to build something simple yet scalable. The current interface is not very scalable because you can't customize it. 
again, it goes back to the idea of being able, being having more ownership over the Repl interface. So this is a um, this is a demo of the new uh, the new sort of IDE experience, and this flipping between mobile and desktop. It's exactly the same components, exactly the same code, just laid out differently. Every one of those panes is actually the um, the sort of the primitive that we're building everything around. And that primitive is this uh, this pane. So when, when you start a pane, it's a launcher. You can open files. You can open output. You can open web view. You can open debugger setting. Whatever you can do with the IDE, they're all built on this single primitive. And what that means is that every pane is actually a full app in itself. And so what that means is that you can lay out the IDE in whatever way you'd want. You want split files, you could do that. You, can, you want multiple outputs, you can do that. You want a web view, a debugger, and a graphics, you could do that. So you could infinitely customize your IDE. But on top of that, this also provides the basic infrastructure to open up Replit as a as a way to build extensions. So in the future, you'll be able to add your own thing here. So you can build uh, an extension and then you could launch it from one of these launchers. So, so this creates a lot of flexibility and every sort of extension can can simply be listed here and can be, can be opened anywhere in the IDE. This also creates this, um, this removes the separation that we have between mobile and desktop. It should be the same code. It should be the same interface. Just lay it out differently. And uh, so Tyler's going to talk more about this uh, at uh, at one thirty p.m. So ma make sure to check out the talk. Um, sorry. Yeah, make sure to check out that talk at one thirty p.m. Okay, so. I think we're done. Oh, actually, one more thing. I told you to stick around until the end because there's one more thing. You know, um, when we start when we started Replit, it was again it was very hard to raise money, despite being ambitious and creative, and uh, we had a team that was really dedicated. And, um, you know, the, the people that really got us was not at, at the beginning was not like the, the, the professional VC or investor community. It was our community. It was our users. It was you. You understood us from the start. You evangelized Replit. You helped us grow. Some of you are even paying for the service. Thank you. And that all helped us along the way to get to where we are today. As we start, started raising money, People from the community have asked us, hey, we want to be able to contribute. We want to be able to be part of the journey. And it really, it really mattered to us when, when people said that they wanted to invest in Replit because, you know, as part of our ethos is like making opportunity available. And one of the biggest opportunities available for only a few people is the ability to invest in startups. And for us, we really want to make this something that anyone has the ability to do. So today we're opening up a $5 million round to invest uh, in Replit. So this is to the community. You can go to wefunder.com for slash Replit to see our WeFunder page. You can get more information about the business and um, and you can, you can show your commitment. We still have to file some documentation in order for this to go live. So we have to file something with the SEC. But now, actually, like the um, the thing that you do is just if you show your commitment, that's going to be a great way for us to open up the round. So go go check it out if you're interested. There are a lot of reasons not to invest in Replit. And by the way, I want to be clear: we don't really need your money. We have a lot of money to continue building our vision. This is this is just because you know people have asked for it, and we thought it would be a really cool thing to do. There are reasons not to invest in in Replit. Start, startups are risky in general, but especially startups like us who are trying to invent something new and bring it to market are going to be especially risky. So if you, know, you know if you can't afford to lose the money, 
please, please don't invest and only invest things you can afford to, to lose. Um, and, um, and so basically, um, yeah, basically you just, uh, go to wefunder.com forward slash replit. And if you ended up contributing, then we will honor your contribution and we will have you with us in this journey. And, you know, everyone at replit will be super driven to make your money worth something. And if you can't, it's fine as well. You're still an, uh, uh, you're still a member of our community and we still honor you and cherish you all the same. So, so thank you. This is, this is my talk exactly on the hour and, um, and I hope to see you out there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amjad. Um, thanks to all of our users for reporting some of those spammy chat messages. I'm sorry about that. We're going to be better about it. But the focus right now is on the amazing announcements that Amjad just made. And we'll be moving into our first round of sessions. I hope you all are really inspired and excited to learn from many of our teammates and our users today. Off we go. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>